Gwenael. Um, so welcome back for this uh, second half of the mini symposium. And um, uh, we are pleased now to welcome Sergei Grudinin uh, for his talk. So Sergei uh, studied in, in Russia and then uh, did his PhD and first postdoc in Yiddish Germany. And then he moved to uh, INRIA Grenoble, where he did another postdoc and then was recruited at CNRS. And uh, he is now a, a team leader of the Nano D team uh, at uh, INRIA since 2018. And his research interests uh, include a lot of what interests us for this mini symposium, um, uh, flexibility, integration of data, uh, deep learning, and so on. So I will leave the floor to Sergey. and thanks a lot for accepting the invitation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, perfect. Okay, uh, so my talk will be around the progress in protein structure prediction. And first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the contributors of my structure prediction team, including collaborators. For example, LOD, who is the co-organizer of the workshop, is uh, also here. And most of the work uh, which was done in my team was performed by my master and PhD students. So to start with, we have just witnessed a revolution in protein structure prediction. So on this slide, you may see the progress in protein structure prediction over many years, which was already presented at the very beginning of, of the workshop. And you can see a tremendous progress in the accuracy since previous CASPs, which are also true for the very difficult targets, basically those targets that do not have any homology with the salt structures. Here you may see some structures predicted by alpha 2 by DeepMind with a near experimental resolution. Basically, the accuracy of the predictions is within 1.5 angstroms. And uh, why did it happen? Because, because, because of uh, many uh, advances in experimental and computational techniques. And here I list those that led to the accuracy of alpha 2 So they've been using a lot, not only them, but they in particular metagenomics and structural templates. Uh, no statistical or models to infer the coevolution signal are used nowadays. So we may use raw multiple sequence alignments uh, we do not use, we don't extensively use uh, uh, some of the initial deep learning architectures. We do not use uh, uh, the famous CNNs. Uh, we are mostly switching into attention networks, which I will explain briefly after. We understood how to properly use the 3D geometry and uh, the symmetry, which is linked to the 3D geometry. We also predict the uncertainty, which allows us to correct the predictions on the fly, or usage of disagreements instead of raw contact maps. And we have, or some of us, especially DeepMind, has a lot of computational resources. And these resources may not be available for everybody. So let me step back two years before when the revolution has just started. So this was during the CASP 13 competition. And this was the keynote slide by David Kels. Uh, according to our understanding two years back, uh, we have just learned how to predict protein structure without handcrafted features. So we have just learned how to use the convolutional neural networks, CNNs, that could extract and learn features automatically. So how does it happen? We specify the convolutional filters that would process uh, initial data layer by layer, and they would progressively extract features on different scales. So first of all, we would start at very high resolution features. Then we would cause grain our representation. We would learn our features on the next scale. We would cause grain it again and learn and learn and learn it progressively. These architectures are typically very deep and they work greatly if our data has the hierarchy of representation. And apparently these architectures do not work if our data are not hierarchical. Fortunately, our proteins do have the hierarchy. For example, we start with the initial building blocks, which are amino acids. These amino acids are linked into polypeptides. Polypeptides are linked with hydrogen bonds. 
and they form uh, secondary structure elements, beta sheets and alpha helices, which are in turn folded into stable domains. And in many cases, these domains interact with each other and they form uh, protein assemblies. So it looks like uh, proteins do have the necessary level of hierarchy, but what is the right level to represent this data? What is the right abstraction level? We may think to represent our proteins as our amino acid sequence or the multiple sequence alignments. And indeed, this was a very successful representation level for many years already. We may also think to learn uh, interactions with proteins and within proteins using the secondary structure elements. However, we will be working with three-dimensional objects, which is very difficult. Instead, we can represent these structural elements as contact maps or as hydrogen maps. Again, this is a very powerful and successful representation level. Alternatively, we can think of a protein as a molecular graph in 3D. There have been some more interest very recently in this type of representations with their multiple methods developed for the last CASP. We may also think of a protein as a set of oriented vectors or the set of balls or the set of point clouds. We may represent it as a volumetric map, for example, as a set of Gaussian clouds. Uh, if we talk about protein-protein interactions, we can also think of proteins as of molecular surfaces. And we can do machine learning based on the surface elements. And finally, we can think of proteins as of uh, 3D tessellation elements. For example, we may split them into Voronoi cells. Uh, one of the most successful methods uh, back in CASP 13 uh, were coevolution based methods that were trained to predict the contact maps. So, uh, this is a slide from uh, David Jones, which was the scientific advisor of the previous version of AlphaFold. And his idea consisted of firstly applying the classical direct Cartan analysis method, DCA model, uh, that would produce uh, 21 by 21 metrics for each of the pair of the residues in the target sequence. And then using these maps, we would uh, apply multiple layers of convolutional neural networks and learn the ground truth contact map. Uh, this model was successful. It provided quite a lot of uh, breakthrough, but unfortunately, this uh, method has uh, quite several limitations. For example, the DCA model infers only the direct coupling, so it doesn't know anything about indirect coupling. And also the data it uses, it's only the correlation meaning that there are only 20 by 20 or 21 by 21 uh, features per amino residue, uh, amino residue couple. Can we do better? Apparently, yes, we can do much, much better. And here I present one of the more recent model, which is very similar to what AlphaFold was doing. And uh, this is also something that uh, recent Rosetta model was using. Basically, the idea consists of not using the multiple sequence alignment, but using many, many, many pairwise alignments. We have a target sequence well aligned with the first protein. We have a, the same sequence aligned with the second protein, and so on and so forth. Then on the next step, we run convolutional, 1D convolutional neural networks to train some embeddings, meaning that we represent each substitution as a vector. In this model, the vector had uh, 64 uh, dimensions with real values. And this vector would not only encode the substitution itself, but it would also encode the local environment, maybe even the global environment, meaning that the substitution in one environment will be rather different from a substitution in a different environment, like in aromatic or uh, polar environment, uh, the substitutions will be very different and this will be encoded in these embeddings. On the next step, we learn the correlations. And the idea to learn the correlations is a new uh, approach, uh, which is uh, referred to as outer products. Meaning that uh, we outer uh, multiply the two embedding vectors and we produce a matrix. 
Then we repeat it many, many, many times for all the homologous proteins. Uh, we average the result and we obtain a matrix that highlights those residues that should uh, co-evolve together or at least that should correlate. And finally, using this coevolution information on the last step, we train a distance estimator, something that converts our coevolution into the distance map. So now let's take a look at the alpha fold two model. Uh, there are many, many, many blocks. Uh, there is an important concept that this is an end-to-end -end architecture, meaning that we start from a row sequence and we end up in a three-dimensional structure. So there are many things uh, to present here, but I would like to highlight only two blocks. First of all, we still cannot start with a single sequence. We necessarily need to start with alignments. Alpha fold 2 starts with the multiple sequence alignment. And the second important point is that they do predict a three-dimensional structure, meaning that the loss function acts on a three-dimensional structure. This was the first time, maybe the second time in the development history when we understood how to compute the loss function in 3D. All the previous models in all the previous CASPs would only consider 2D maps. And 2D maps are very restrictive because they could not differentiate many possible positions of, uh, of, 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 of atoms and molecules in 3D. Thanks to this 3D representation and uh, to the loss function, we can back, back propagate uh, the arrows uh, and uh, we can efficiently do our multiple iterations uh, to, to apparently correctly fold these structures. Uh, there are also several important points that I will describe uh, later. For example, Alpha Fold 2 and several other teams have been extensively using geometric learning. So what is geometric learning? This is uh, simply a learning on non-structured data. In uh, image recognition tasks, we often use a pixelized representations. We are working on re regular pixels, so we can apply regular uh, filters. However, many other domain of data have our data represented as uh, point clouds, vectors, graphs. And uh, we were one of the first that were trying to, to, to learn on non-regular data. For example, in our first model, we represented protein as a Voronoi tessellation. And then we can see that the most important information is already contained in the features of the Voronoi cells. Then we constructed a graph out of the Voronoi tessellation. And we have to redefine uh, the classical operations, uh, uh, the convolution operator and the pooling operator. So a bit more technically, uh, what is a graph convolutional network? Uh, this is a message, message passing network uh, that exchanges messages between the nodes. And in the most classical formulation on each of the steps, uh, we simply aggregate the messages from all of the neighbors. So this was our first attempt called War CNN, which was uh, quite a successful quality estimator of the uh, protein folds. But uh, unfortunately, such a simplistic representation doesn't take into account the correct 3D geometry of each of the nodes and its neighbors, which motivated us to extend this model to something which is called uh, spherical graph convolutional network. And our idea was to extend the message exchange to also incorporate the angular information about all the neighbors. So we represented uh, this angular information using classical spherical harmonics, uh, which are here, uh, which allowed us to learn not only uh, the average or uh, aggregation, but also all the angular dependencies of the neighbors. So these are the filters that have been launched. And then these filters are substituted here. And uh, when we apply this model, we also take into account the angular distributions of the methods of the, of the neighbors. Again, uh, this method was uh, quite successful in the quality fault assessments in the, in the recent CASP. Uh, another technique that became apparent in the last CASP was 
uh, the insufficiency of convolutional filters because if we want to learn uh, long dependence or in space or time or something else, we will have to apply multiple convolution operators because the receptive field is rather limited. Uh, which uh, motivated the community to propose something else. For example, already in the previous CASP, uh, specifically the AlphaFold 1 model, uh, was using so-called dilated convolutions. So these are the convolutions uh, with some gaps which have a wider receptive field. And in the natural language processing models and by several teams in CASP 14, particular alpha fold two, a new architecture, which is called attention was used. The attention architecture does not use, uh, does not need multiple steps to achieve long range interaction. So they can uh, cover, they can learn long range interaction in a single step. Uh, these attention networks can also be applied to other representations, for example, to graphs. And uh, there are very popular models nowadays that uh, do graph attention uh, graph attentions we need to also carefully think about the 3d space because uh, 3d space and classical 2d images are rather different uh, for example our proteins they first of all do not have a standard shape and standard orientation secondly they have our local motifs that may be repeated uh, through 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 the molecule for example, here you may see the same motif in two different orientations, and we need to be able to correctly detect these motifs. Then our multiple residues and multiple orientations can interact with each other, and this normally should change the properties of the molecule. Uh, we need to think about uh, these properties, uh, which can be referred to as a local equivariance of our model. And finally, some properties of our molecules should not change upon global translation or the global rotation. So we need to also think about the global invariance of our machine learning model. So how to deal with all of these issues? Well, we, we know pretty well how to deal with this. Uh, there have been many models developed, which I will present slightly later. Uh, these models can be applied to continuous uh, density re representation or to the point clouds. Uh, if we think about uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, we may think about rotor translational correlational filters, which is the extension of classical convolutional filters. And finally, we can also work on graphs and we can uh, learn this information using graph attention networks. Uh, generally, we may think of two approaches. There is a general approach uh, a class of models which are called equivariant networks and uh, they can be explained using a very simple idea we may think of our uh, models as a multiple expansion model for example we may represent our features as a uh, single uh, value as, as, as a set of scalars Plus, this can be augmented with the second order features that depend on the distribution of the distances. Then our model can be augmented with another set of features which can be represented as distribution of distribution of the distances and so on and so forth. So each of the terms will represent and will learn the invariant representation of our data. Because scalars don't depend on the orientation, then uh, pairwise distances do not depend on the global orientation, the distribution of the distribution of the distances do not depend and so on and so forth. And uh, this model can be uh, formulated more generally using some group representations. Another idea will be, thanks uh, uh, to the local geometry of the proteins and other chain molecules is to use uh, the local frames of the peptidic chain. So each of uh, the subunits may have some local coordinate system and we can locally learn the environment in this specific coordinate system. So here I present you a model that we developed uh, two years ago for the previous CASP edition. Uh, 
where we would locally apply convolutional neural networks in the local coordinate system, and uh, we would uh, construct a model that learns the quality of protein folding. And currently, this model is also used by the Rosetta scoring function. So, uh, a short outline in the future, since the protein structure prediction problem is essentially solved, uh, I believe there will be many more uh, developments on the protein representation, and specifically, we will see many more developments uh, using NLP, uh, natural language processing models. I also feel that molecular dynamics will be uh, used less and less. And I need to say that folding kinetics uh, and the actual protein folding problem is, uh, is not yet solved. So what we see right now and what we will see in the nearest future is the prediction of multiple protein uh, states and the protein flexibility. Also, the protein docking can be used or to a certain extent using uh, big data. And finally, uh, protein design can also be used, uh, can also be solved using this type of approaches. And probably I will try to uh, put three more slides about the current developments. So what about the protein flexibility? We've just seen this year uh, three methods by three different groups that use uh, deep learning to learn a certain latent representation of the protein flexibility. So you may think of it as a trainable normal modes or a trainable PCA analysis. So there was one architecture from CryDragon with the latent uh, uh, variables in the center of the architecture. There was another recent paper from this year from uh, CrySpark. Again, there was a latent representation, but at the very beginning of the architecture. And uh, a week ago, another paper from DeepMind has been released, which is very similar by the architecture to, to CryDragon. Again, there is a latent space uh, where all the motion happens. Uh, so all these papers are from this year. What about protein docking? Again, we see quite a tremendous progress. There have been approaches that have been trying to simultaneously dock and fold proteins. For example, the basic idea is to consider multiple chains as a single protein with some gaps and to learn coevolution signals or on a unified protein representation. So here you may see uh, two quadrants that represent the coevolution signal inside each of the proteins and two other quadrants represent coevolution signals between the proteins. And there are some successful predictions. So these are the models from Arne Ellison team. And he says that this method works in about 20% of the cases. Uh, there are very similar developments from the Rosetta team. So these are the examples from uh, TR Rosetta during the CASP. And these are another models of our protein docking from coevolution. Uh, just published with Rosetta TTA fold. And finally, we have also seen very beautiful prediction from alpha fold, where the goal was to predict an obligatory complex, but they didn't know this information that it was an obligatory complex. And the prediction can be superposed very nicely on this complex, even though it was predicted as a monomer. And my last slide is the protein design. So if you remember the end-to-end -end models, you can imagine that if we go from amino acid sequence to the 3D structure, we may invert this architecture, or we can perturb this architecture such that we can use the mismatch and backpropagate the signal such that we can uh, do something with the sequence. So this is one of the attempts from the Rosetta team. And there is a recent attempt, which is not using Monte Carlo perturbation, that, but which is uh, uh, using the actual backpropagation gradient. So, First, the model computes the loss in the prediction of the distance map with the ground truth. Then it backpropagates the gradients uh, through the neural network. And then it computes the uh, uh, perturbation to the amino acid sequence. And finally, we also witness a lot of developments in the protein language models. So these are the models uh, that are not supervised or semi-supervised that are trained on a huge amount of uh, data 
And uh, during the training, we know nothing. Typically, we know nothing about the 3D structure. We know only the, uh, the sequences. So there is a set of models trained using recurrent neural networks. Uh, and also there are more recent developments using this so-called transformers. So these are more powerful, but much more demanding models. And for example, the one presented here, which is called Progen, it has more than 1 billion of trainable parameters. So I would like to stop here. I am out of time. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you want to have more references, I recommend to read our review, which has been written with my colleagues uh, for the data assisted track of the last CASP competition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergei, for uh, this great presentation and very nice uh, view on a field that's moving really fast. I'm sure there are uh, a lot of, uh, of questions, but if no one dares, so please ask your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Ah, yeah, there's one question already by Louis Bequet. Are there big differences in the data set requirements between the different architectures that you presented? Convolution, dilated, attention, graph? Oh, oh yeah, so yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Uh, the, the more we advance, the more data we use. So the most data demanding architectures are those that use uh, raw sequence data and even metagenomics data. So these models can be trained on millions and millions and millions of sequences, and they would have uh, billions of parameters. So to train such a model, we have to use uh, national resources that we cannot even afford in Europe. So only Facebook and Google can afford these models. And there was an initiative in the United States uh, to use the national resources to train protein language models. So these are the most expensive. Compared to, to the structural data, 3D data, normally we can afford it even locally. So in my team, we can, we can train uh, models on 3D data. But again, uh, there are different complexities, of course, depending on uh, which type of uh, techniques, which convolutions do we use, and also how many deep layers are in the model. The deeper the architecture, the more complex uh, is the model, more parameters it has, and uh, uh, more training time it, it, it requires. I think um, maybe I, I read it too quickly, but the question was also uh, of the data set requirements, so maybe the input data that you need for the different... Oh, well, sure. maybe we can also. yes, of course, again, using the sequences, we can, uh, we can pre-select sequences, we can train on all possible metagenomic sequences, uh, we can separate the two steps. Uh, for example, we can uh, train a sequence mo model in advance, and then we can use a pre-trained uh, model and reduce it using our 3D, 3D subsets. Again, there is a quite, uh, quite a choice, quite a lot of freedom here. So some models are so general that uh, they can be reduced quite easily using specific data. Okay, so. thanks. Um, there's a question from SG, if you want to open your microphone and just ask it. Um, thank you. Thank you for this presentation, Sergei. So um, when we made the um, individual, like more in-depth analysis for the CAS 14 assessment paper, uh, we also did our best to compare the performances of the um, contact base, more like deep learning incorporated complex modeling methods versus more traditional ones. And there we couldn't, as of now, at least, we couldn't uh, fetch a major difference. So I was wondering uh, which type of different developments do you think that it's necessary to have um, a, an improvement over here? Because obviously this has a lot of potential, uh, but how do you see this? So which, which parts are still, uh, which yeah, is yeah, still yeah. Uh, challenging? Uh, so there are two components. Thank you very much. I think Rosetta was still bad and Rosetta was heavily using uh, co-evolutionary information between the domains. It's, it was comparable to Van Slova's models when we made the well, in-depth yes, analysis. Yes, it, it, yes, yes, I agree, I agree, I agree. Mm -hmm. They didn't use any co-evolution, only structural templates. Yes. So I think we, we have to have a significant progress in understanding the protein language models. We need to understand uh, the co-evolution signals much better because uh, they are, this signal is very weak for different domains and sometimes we do not see it. And secondly, uh, we have to work on the structural side 
we have to understand the protein flexibility because proteins are flexible. In order to bind, they need to change the shape. Without changing the shape, we can do nothing. So we need to solve the flexibility problem first. And secondly, we need to work on uh, the geometric learning. We need to understand how proteins interact. And for this issue, I believe we need much more structural data. So in order to understand or to solve for protein docking using deep learning, we have to have much more structural data compared to what we have right now. Thank you. So Francois Coste is asking, yeah, exactly. um, do you know interoperability of the prediction? Yes, uh, this is a, an issue in all the domains. So there is a big issue in the interoperability explainability in the classical uh, applications in computer vision. Here, yes, of course, when we can, we try to visualize uh, the filters, for example, the, the features that we have learned. And in many cases, it is possible and they do have sense. In some cases, some very deep models are unexplainable, which is a pity, but I think explainability and uh, interpretability is coming. So this will be required from these models maybe in five years. Uh, Thank you very much, Sergey. Um, and now uh, I will uh, let Elodie present the next speaker. Thank you so much. Yeah.